Good evening, everyone. I'll wait a second for you to get your seats. My name is Brian Garrick. On behalf of the hub of the JCCSF, welcome to Canbar Hall. Thank you for joining me for tonight's program, The New American Haggadah. First off, I want to let you know about a change in the program. I am elated to let you know that Daniel Handler, a.k.a. Lemony Snicket, will be joining the festivities tonight. This program is made possible in part through the Toby Corrette Center for Jewish Peoplehood, Linda and Sandy Galanter, Lisa and John Pritzker, and the Ingrid Tober Philanthropic Fund of the Jewish Community Federation. I'd also like to thank our community partners, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, the Magnus Collection of Jewish Life and Art at UC Berkeley, and the Young Adult Community of Congregation Emmanuel. Now is a good time to turn off your cell phones. Please don't take any photos, video, and recording of any kind. In the unlikely chance um, we'll need to exit the building, please note the nearest emergency exit, which are the doors that you came in. If you have to go out for some reason, please exit via the doors in the back. And now I want to let you know about a few upcoming events. Uh, celebrate Passover here at the JCCSF. Join our community on Friday, April 6th for the first night community Passover Seder. Then on Tuesday, April 17th, the JCCSF and the Jewish Community Relations Council celebrate the goal of economic justice, justice at our 16th annual Multicultural Freedom Seder. On Tuesday, April 3rd, rising star comedian and regular guest on Chelsea Lately Moshe Kasher will be here to discuss his hilarious memoir, Kasher in the Rye, the true tale of a white boy from Oakland who became a drug addict, criminal, mental patient, and then turned 16. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, finally, on Monday, April 23rd, the very funny and inventive Israeli writer Edgar Carrot will be here in conversation with the author Michael Shabon to discuss Carrot's new volume of short stories and flash fiction, Suddenly, A Knock on the Door. And now on to our program this evening. Many of us grew up with the Maxwell House Haggadah, the old school pamphlet style version, the old school pamphlet style version that our parents got free from the grocery store that's filled with old English thous and these. It's still around. And then there are the countless versions tailored to your own interests, politics, and affiliations. This year, a very special Haggadah has just been published, New American Haggadah. So, new, Manishtana. What makes this Haggadah different from all other Haggadot? This incarnation is a Haggadah from a new generation of Jewish American writers and intellectuals that marks their place in the chain of tradition. Tonight, we are lucky to have Jonathan Safran Foyer, Nathan Englander, Daniel Handler, AKA Lemony Snicket, and Nathaniel Deutsch all here to discuss this landmark work. The Haggadah itself is supposed to spur on conversation. So without further ado, please welcome these gentlemen to the stage. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out um, to hear this conversation. And what I wanted to do was actually start with what I consider to be the most difficult question of the night, so we can kind of get it out of the way and we can move on to other things. And that is, um, what exactly is a Haggadah? And the reason why I, I frame it that way is because on the one hand, the Haggadah has Torah in it, but, but whether or not it's Torah is, is, is a question. 
It has stories in it, but it's not only stories. Uh, it has prayers in it, but it's not a siddur. Um, and it has songs in it, but, but it's not a songbook. So I want to open it up to everyone, but maybe Jonathan, you can start by, by, uh, by at least giving one answer of what, what is a Haggadah. Well, in the most straightforward sense, it's a kind of user's manual for Passover, which is the most widely celebrated um, Jewish holiday. I, I was in London about a month or two ago speaking about this. Somebody got excited about London? Is that yeah. Um, it's in England. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, was, I was in uh, London about a month ago to talk about the Haggadah. And I always, I don't know why, but I always have a problem with um, uh, immigration whenever I enter England. They always ask me um, lots and lots of questions. So um, this time I sort of steeled myself and thought, let's just answer things in the most straightforward way. We'll, we'll facilitate the process and, and get out of here, not be cute, not be funny. And so the guy looked at the, the sheet and he said, so you're here on business. What kind mm -hmm. of business? And I said, I'm here to talk about a book. And he said, okay, uh, this is a book you wrote. I said, well, not, 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 not really. No, not really. I said, not really. Well, is this a work of fiction? I said, well, you know, is it a, is it a work of fiction? Um, and I realized that, you know, it's a, it is a very difficult book to describe because it's not yeah. exactly fiction. It's not exactly nonfiction. It's not ex exactly a prayer book. It's not exactly a song book. It's not exactly a work of poetry, it's not exactly um, an ethical argument, um, it's not exactly a historical document, but of course it's all of those things mm -hmm. and a lot more. So um, it, it is, a, above all, a unique book. I can't think of any other book that has the same kind mm -hmm. of materiality that a Haggadah has, that's used, um, that's read at a table, you know, during an activity that is read um, from beginning to end in one sitting, or that is supposed to be read from beginning to end in one sitting. <laughs> when we used to use the Maxwell House at my grandparents' house, um, we would read from beginning to end with, with very large um, passages skipped. And, and in a way, that was the, the ambition in, in making this particular Haggadah was that it would be one that people wanted to linger on, you know, mm -hmm. not, not breeze through, not skim, not, um, you know, w wait to get to the end of, but instead want, want to linger on. Mm. Do, do either of you, Daniel or Nathan, do you want to add to anything about what you think the Haggadah is or its significance? Or I, I just want everyone to pretend we're all dressed like Daniel, if you would. <laughs> all right. I would feel better that yeah. we're outclassed. It's the JCC, I told them. Yes. <laughs> Put on a tie. <laughs> Won't kill you. Um, <laughs> I, well, I, th this maybe isn't about what is a Haggadah, but yeah. I got curious when you were talking about I, that I wonder if designing a Haggadah that isn't skimmed is somehow contrary to the <laughs> tradition going back <laughs> thousands of years. Because at least my self-hypnosis while working on my small part of the Haggadah was it will likely be skipped. Right. You don't have to worry about how good it is <laughs> because it will be skipped. That's fine. I mean, but that talks about, that actually seriously addresses different traditions because I grew up Orthodox and everything's supposed to be done as if you're an auctioneer. Like, in a sense, it's all about rote. You know, like, don't ask a question, don't pause. It's saying every word, but in the, you know, right. still beating the fastest time. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> a, a question was never asked in my whole life. Not one. Just four. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when did you decide to do uh, Haggadah? When did you? Uh... I was looking back through. I mean, first of all, I should say there's nothing at all new about that idea. If anything, it makes me normal, not exceptional. There've been there's no book that has been revisited more times than the Haggadah, or, mm -hmm. or to my knowledge, that has more um, editions. Yeah, there's many thousands of, I mean, five, seven to, seven, thousand, five to seven yeah. thousand, yeah. I mean. So, you know, wherever there have been Jews, whenever there have been Jews, there have been Haggadahs. Um, I, and, and I also imagine that many people in this audience have had this thought, and probably many people in this audience have, in one way or another, actually made one. You know, mm -hmm. when, at, at that, the first night, 
Seder was at my parents' house, and my parents would make a Haggadah, usually just by, you know, cobbling together things from others or, or printing stuff um, from, from the internet when, when we started doing that. Mm -hmm. So, it, to me, it seemed like a very natural idea and a continuation of the way that, the, that Haggadahs have been used had been used in my family and also historically. I mean, it's a, it's a book that really invites revisiting and I think even demands it. If at the heart of it is this empathic leap we're supposed to make mm -hmm. to feel as if we are not recipients of a story but characters inside yeah. the story, that we ourselves were liber liberated from Egypt, it's, it is, it is a, a really profound demand. And that's what's on the cover here. Yeah. It's that fact, that idea that in every generation everyone should imagine themselves that they've that they've left Egypt. Right. So how do you do that? I mean, I don't know how you do it, but I know how you don't do it. You know, you don't do it by having a book that you want to skim. You don't do it by having a book that is, at best, good by the standards we use to judge um, Haggadahs instead of mm -hmm. our favorite books. Um, that, you know, you don't do it by having kitschy illustrations. You don't do it by having, um, I think, cheap production value. You know, there's certain decisions you can make, I think, that not reinvent what it is, but just tune the instrument in such a way mm -hmm. that it's more um, available. It creates more space for users. It's accessible and, and engaging. So was choosing a translator one of the first deci decisions you made, or, or at least inviting Nathan to be the translator? Did you think of anyone else before? No, I, I, Many I, people before. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, got, I got a lot yeah. of no's. A lot I turned of it down no's. and I don't even speak Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> So, so now that we have that out of the way, did you, what, Nathan, was there, was, Nathan was the first translator that I approached. Okay. The and only why, translator why did you, that I why did, why did you approach him? Um, I thought he would do the best job. I mean, I know that mm. that's a simple answer, but it, it is how I felt. I, you know, one, th there are a group of people who would be the sort of usual suspects for this kind of project, translators of, um, you know, Hebrew literature. Um, people like um, Robert Alter, you mm -hmm. know, who, who would do really fantastic jobs. There's no... It, it's, it, it's, you know, it's funny, it, it's difficult to talk about Haggadah's, um, um, or it's very tempting to talk about them as if they're a competition. Like, what is better about this one, you know? The, the challenge is not to make a better one, there's no scale that, that the, the quality could be measured on, except perhaps the like, quality of the conversations around a particular Seder table, but there's no way that you could have one version that would appeal mm -hmm. to everybody. Um, so for the version that I had in mind and for the Seder table that I had in mind, Nathan made the most sense because I thought he could, you know, for two reasons. One, because of just his mastery of language. Um, I, I knew that he would convey what is um, beautiful in the document and what is um, captivating about the story that it tells, but also you know, a lot, when people review Nathan's books, they almost always, it seems to me, refer to a kind of um, moral clarity, that they are not stories that are indifferent to big moral questions, but they really um, make that their business. And the combination of those two things, like a, if there were a way to capture in English the, the, the sort of, um, the, the morality and the lyricism of the Hebrew text, that that would be a wonderful thing, and I think it's exactly what he did. Mm. So Nathan, when Jonathan approached you with the idea of translating the Haggadah, what was your first reaction? Oh, that it was a terrible idea. Mm. I really, it, you know, it's so, it's so nice being on this side of it. I can't believe we're actually sitting here with this, because that's it. everything's charming in hindsight. Like, he get, had the idea nine years ago, six years ago. It's, it's a lot of years. That how, how long ago was it? How many years was well, this? Well, I mean, he's had the idea for near a decade, but I've been mm. working on this for three years, mm -hmm. so... But, but, but that's the idea. I've never translated. I do, me, I speak menu based, you know, a Klein, a Bira. I can like order in any yeah. country. That's the whole of my translation <laughs> history. You know, and this is the idea. Yeah. Also this idea which uh, Jonathan calls me out on a lot of feeling very radically secular and sort of like I work hard. The way people work at religion, I work in my atheism, I fail. I, it's a long journey, atheism, <laughs> for me. But I've been, I've been battling it for a long time. But, you know, but that, that you know, he, but he just really made clear, it was just a really, it's just a different way than you'd ever interact. You know, we all write fiction. It's like th this idea you would never interact. You know what I'm saying? I was just here a month ago with a, with a book. I would never say like, I, I, 
Oh, it's radio. I was going to curse a million times, right? We're on radio. Anyway, but, you know, you'd never be like, I killed. Like, this is, you know what I'm saying? It's a yeah. different, this is not our text. I mean, I think I love a design thing that I thought was so smart of Jonathan, but this band that falls away, like, you know, if it didn't need the names on the set, but this idea that we should fall away, this is not our text. Mm -hmm. This is not our book. And that whole idea that we were being part of, that he said we can be part of something that we'll be really proud of and build mm -hmm. something together. And that's what really got me. And I think it's actually when I went to look, I never used, you know, back to the auctioneer thing, I never looked at the English side. I just never, it was never part of my life. And the example that really, you know, also Jonathan, uh, again, he knows my brain pen really well. He sent me off to think. And, and I opened, I don't remember which Haggadah, but I opened a, a Haggadah. First I found a Haggadah and then I opened it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and then it said it was, uh, you know, Hamavdil, uh, you know, from the, from the, the Havdalah, Hamavdil bin Kodesh the Kodesh, like to differentiate. It, you know, the English I saw is to differentiate between Sabbath and the Holy Day, which is a perfect translation, an accurate translation. It extends the meaning of this sentence. You know, ben Kodesh, the Kodesh, it means the space between the Sabbath and the Holy Day, except I look around the page. We have the word for Shabbat. We have the word for Chag or Yom Tov or whatever. We have these words. Why does it say ben Kodesh, the Kodesh? Like, the meaning is, yes, between the Sabbath and the Holy Day, but but what it says is between holy and holy, to separate, to differentiate between holy and holy. And when I looked at that, even the, the cook, like ben kodosh le kodosh, between, you know, we traded for an H, between holy and holy, but that space, you know, I know the space between the Sabbath and the holiday, I get that. You know, I, I, we live in this world, but this is about another world, this is about a metaphysical space. You could spend, you know, forget a conversation, you could spend the whole Seder and not even get off Havdalah and just think, what is the space that happens between holy and holy? And when I saw mm -hmm. that, then I understood back to one person, like what a translation is. I get, it's, you know, I, 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 it's like when I lived in Israel and I understood that, you know, I lived across from the Knesset and I never understood that in America that people run the country and then I became terrified. I thought they knew more. But in that same thing, if you believe, no, but seriously, if you believe like the Torah, like Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God in heaven above, like told the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, like Moses, our teacher at Sinai, like that's the word of God. Nobody thinks God translated the Italian edition or the Greek, you know what I'm saying? It's people, the King James, what was a translation? And that idea that somebody has to choose these words. And then I understood what I hear in my head, like I, I can't say it enough times, but you should read it and weep. This is one of the most, like there's bitter, nasty child that I was. Like there's few texts that really are, are this close to me. I, I, that was a positive holiday for me. And, and just, I learned this text so many times and you studied in school and it just, it, it just, it's so deeply beautiful in my head. And then I understood that I, what the task would be to mm -hmm. just simply translate it. You know, when I looked at the others, I said, none of these things were saying what I hear. And so, you know. Well, I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading a, a part sure. of the, your translation. Oh, I happen to have one yeah. here. That's oh, like on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's like that so talk convenient. show I thing have where one. they're yeah. like, oh, oddly, I have a banjo behind this chair. <laughs> <laughs> that's so weird. Uh, I will just read a quick, it's a, uh, and I believe the same for fiction, just to let you hear. But this is from Nishmat uh, Kolchai, which is uh, from Halo, which doesn't just get said on on Pesach, it gets said bunches of time. We're always saying Hallel. Anyway, but this is an especially beautiful part. Uh, I say all credit if anything strikes you as nice to the Hebrew. But uh, this is, uh, to me, one of the most poetic. Stop introducing it, just read. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let the spirit of all life bless your name, Lord God of us, and the breath of all flesh glorify and extol our remembrance of you, our eternal King. From infinity and to infinity you are God, and without you we have no king to redeem and deliver, to ransom and rescue, to provide and be compassionate through every period of difficulty and distress. We have no king but you, God of the first and the last, God of all creations, masters of all generations, who is praised with an abundance of veneration, who pilots his world with beneficence and his creations with compassion and the Lord does not drowse and does not sleep. He is the one who wakes sleepers and rouses those under the spell of slumber, who gives voice to the mute and unbinds the bound and braces the falling and straightens the bent. It is to you, to you alone, that we are thankful. Word our mouths were filled with a singing like the sea, and our tongues awash with song as waves countless and our lips lauding as the skies are wide, and our eyes illumined like the sun and the moon, and our hands spread out like the eagles of heaven, and our feet as fleet as fawns 
Still, we would not suffice in thanking you, Lord God of us and God of our fathers, in blessing your name for even one of a thousand thousand from the thousands of thousands and the ten thousands of ten thousands of times you did good turns for our fathers and for us. Yeah. Jonathan, I, I want to ask you a little bit about the process of putting together the other uh, people who contributed to the, to the Haggadah. On the Little Brown website, um, if you go there, you'll still find a long list of contributors. Howard Jacobson, <laughs> uh, Simon Shama, Tony Kushner, Michael Pollan, a bunch of other ones. The only one who is still standing or st who, is, who is in the Haggadah now is uh, Daniel Handler or he's listed there, Lemony Snicket. <laughs> So, so uh, my question is, what happened to everyone else? Um, and uh, yeah, what happened to everyone else? And how did you decide on the final format? Uh, now that you had Nathan in place. And well, you know, we haven't actually talked about your role yet as well. Um, True. Nathaniel is one of, the, one of the four commentators working throughout. It's Nathaniel, Daniel, um, Rebecca Newberger, Goldstein, and Jeffrey Goldberg. And um, you have been a around really since the beginning. I mean, we've been talking about this for, I don't know, years and years yeah. and years. Um, but the project expanded and contracted. I, I thought in the beginning that making a good Haggadah would, be, would, would involve bringing together really great writing and really great art. Um, and, and that was naive. You know, I. I, I think I was guided by an idea that, that the book would be an act of self-expression, and then I came to think of it more as an act of Haggadah expression, you know, trying to figure out what, what is here and how to present it in its most robust form. So in the beginning, I contacted writers that I admired, artists that I admired. The first contribution I got was from the painter R.B. Kitai, um, who lived in L.A., and um, and he made a really uh, beautiful drawing for the book. The first text that I received was from Howard Jacobson um, about Dayenu. And it's not that I ever received a better piece of writing or piece of art than those two. They were absolutely magnificent. But as I started to get more writing and art, I realized that I was accidentally creating an anthology or a reference book, but not a Haggadah, not something that someone would have at the table and and use in the ways that we were discussing before. And definitely not something that would inspire that radical empathy that I think is at the heart of the book, or should be. So after I got, I don't know, 20, between 20 and 30 of these pieces together, I realized the mistake that I'd made, and I started to, to squeeze it, to contract it, all the way down to the translation and these four voices that work throughout um, the, the, I sometimes joke that the kill fees for this book were actually greater than the fees for work that went in. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the nature of the project. It was, you could say it was very, very inefficient. You could say it was a waste of time. Or there's another way of looking at it too, which is you know, gratefulness. So, so how do people take it when you said, you know what, actually I don't want to use your piece anymore? Um, different people <laughs> took it differently. Yeah. <laughs> no, right. Ask me a name and I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we'll wait until the, au the audience can do that. I, I'm, I'm interested in, in... Some of them are in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what was it about Daniel that he's, he's still in it? I mean, he was in that original list. It was not a question of the quality. Uh, yeah. This is now going to sound like a really... <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> it, was not a, it, was not, it was not... It was not... Um, <laughs> Let me try. Go on. How, about, try. how about with respect to the others? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the challenge was to find the right voices to push against this book in such a way that the book would push back, give back. Mm -hmm. And what I decided was having these four different writers working throughout, um, commenting on these kind of most familiar moments, the moments when I think most families are inclined to pause. You know, look up and say, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. And in fact, you, you, you helped me make <coughs> that, that list. Um, and I knew that I wanted to have a voice to engage the younger people at the table. I mean, I think that that is really fundamental to the experience of a Seder. You know, if, if it is a, uh, if there's a transmission of values going on, um, 
they're being transmitted to, to the young. Um, so much of the book is organized uh, around or for younger people, not only things like the four questions, but you know, some of the ritual, ritualistic activity, which might not even have any um, straightforward meaning, but seems to be there to kind of punctuate the order or to give people a reason to stay involved, um, to linger, to pay attention. And, you know, there is simply nobody who does it better than, than he does, you know, engaging young people in, in stories. So I, I honestly don't know what I would have done if he had said no. So what did you, what did you think when he, when he asked you to participate in the Haggadah? What was your first reaction? Um, well, he asked me when I was one, I mean, he asked me when I was one of a large number of contributors, yeah. and I thought it would be fun. Um, and it, and it wasn't. No, and, um, <laughs> but, we, but I think what happened, I mean, I think what happened with the project on the whole was that um, everyone going in thought it would be easier and kind of lighter than it turned out to be. So um, I gave him a little piece that was about the 10 plagues that is not in the Haggadah now. And, um, and then he came back and asked me, um, instead of that one piece, why don't you do a whole bunch of pieces? And then I, and then I, for the first time, it, it, I mean, I think it's as you said. I thought about it as a Haggadah rather than I thought about it as something that mm. I could add to a big mm. project. Yeah. And um, and so I went and I I knew where my Haggadah was, so that part wasn't very hard. But I went <laughs> and um, and looked at mine. Uh, you know, I think for the first time at. A, a time of year that wasn't Passover, um, and it's not, it wasn't the Maxwell House. I have a, the I, I, th I think it's kind of standard West Coast Reform Judaism pathways through the Haggadah. The, the Kardashian Haggadah. The Kardashian, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got this bling all over. It's real nice, real classy. Um, uh, no, these I mean these unmistakably '70s illustrations, and um, and I looked through it, and so I and I had looked through it since I was a child, and now their copies are mine, and my wife and I add to the Haggadah every year and swear that we're gonna kind of actually put it together rather than having post-its and handouts and things like that, but you don't want to do it right after Pesach is over, and then you don't want to do it in July, and then you don't want to do it in November, and then you don't do it. Um, and so for the first time, I looked at it and read it and looked at everything that, that she and I had tried to put in it and then tried to, to think about what I could add and that I knew that I was the commentator for children and, um, and then also tried to fit it in to the voice of Lemony Snicket, who's maybe even more distant and dark than I am, <laughs> maybe. Um, and, and so took it, I mean, I think took it really much more seriously than I took it when I was first asked. That, for me, that was one of the most interesting things about doing the commentary is that one, as you mentioned, you're, you're engaging with this text that you've engaged with a bunch of other times, but it's always during Pesach. And here you're doing it like in November or July or whatever. I mean, it took a long time at least, you know, to, to work on this, uh, to work on the commentary. And also you're, you're spending a long time with it different moments and kind of thinking about it and meditating on it. And I really felt like I, I have a, and I'm, I'm sure it translating it, I mean, for three years, you just develop a completely different relationship to it. You see so much more in it. When yeah, I, I mean, you're all, it's, nobody's gonna remember Private Benjamin, but let's say like signing up for the French Foreign Legion. But it's that idea, like we all, I also contribute a little thing. It's when, when you, it's, it's, it's really strange because we're all in different places and we're all working on it separately. But uh, you know, what I hear everybody saying is that when you commit to, we are, we all, are compulsive people, I speak for it. But this idea, like, there's nothing, you know, to write fiction, you know, there's no reason to drag yourself out of bed in the morning and sit at a desk all day and have, like, these things become obsessive, and it's like, that's it, once you understood the way to, I say, for me, it was really this idea where I say not being religious, being totally secular, you know, when I started to think, 
you know, people are using the English side are going to be praying to God for, I'm going to choose the words. Like I mm. literally, that's it. It's, it's not you. Like I have to <clears throat> choose words from which people are going to pray seriously to God. Like it doesn't matter what I believe it's behind that. And that gets back to uh, this story always comes out naturally, but, but Baruch is here somewhere tonight, Baruch Thaler. But, uh, you know, all the, when I used to have, when I used to be a young woman, when my first book came out, I had, you know, long hair, I was a lot more recognizable and people would always come up to me when I was working in my coffee shop and say like, Oh, I read your stuff, and if they read it, they know to say something Jewish, and they usually say, like, I'm religious, like, I once had matzah. You know, like, they'll say <laughs> something like that. I saw Yento, you know, like, but anyway, this guy came, in, came up to you, oh, can I talk to you about a story, and he just, you know, it's around Columbia, and he looked like a nice Columbia hippie arts dude, yeah. you know, and then he started talking, and I recognize, honestly, and I embarrass you if you're here, but, like, that I'm talking one of the great minds that I've ever, just a stranger, where I thought, like, this guy is a crazed, uh. Gen- like both literary, like you'd learn the secular word, but truly like a command of Torah and idea and philosophy that just blew me away. And when I, had, as I, you know, the cold sweat that comes with every project had roughed out this translation, I was a few weeks in, you know, saying I just need another few weeks or three more years and I'll be done. <laughs> but the point is I said like, you know what? A traditional text demands a traditional, like I grew up, it's chavut to study. There's a reason we mm. do these things, like, you know, the root chaver, but head to head study where you go. And, and I said, you know, that's if anyone in the world would understand where my head is now and understand what was and, and this whole tradition. And, and Baruch, then I hadn't seen him in years, walked into the coffee shop and I said, literally, I have been waiting for you. And I asked. So you, him, knew, you knew him before? Just from the, that guy who oh. come up to me that I just hadn't seen, but oh, right. I thought, you okay. know what? Of all the people, I was literally thinking about him like, yeah. it's Bashert, I tell you. But it really is. But then, you know, when I asked him if he'd be involved, and we literally studied, you know, I always say, my poor girlfriend, my mom just came back from Israel and brought mezuzot. Is that enough of a hint if she brings me mezuzot and says, there's cloth, the things that just screw them on, you know, and give it, but my girlfriend, who I don't even have a mezuzah on the door, and she'd be like, I have to live in a, it was like living in a study. She'd come on, there'd be gemaras to the ceiling. We'd have the thumb, we'd be arguing, you know, into the night, one line, and the, yeah, I won't have a mezuzah, but I will turn the house into a study hall, so. Yeah. But yeah, we worked together. I mean, it was just such a beautiful, and that's the idea. I love, back to Jonathan's very, you know, overly generous cup, but I love language. The idea of sitting, this is informed, you know, the book that I finished was written because of this Haggadah, I feel like, because of these projects. Just to get back to that thing, to spend the day arguing a word, half a line, to look at meaning, to say, here's the word, okay, let's look at a Haggadah before, let's look at one 500 years before, let's look at one 1,000 years before, and then you're back in the Torah and looking at the context, mm-hmm. you know, back to, you know, ben, you know you know, Vahir, Vahiboker, Yom Shishi, like it's not just kiddish, it's like this is creation, like you're back in creation and arguing it, and it was, it just became true study. I mean, I, I felt also that it was, first of all, I was impressed when, when we first talked about how serious you were about it, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it. And uh, as I got involved in it, I mean, I, I took it very seriously too. It was sort of hard not to. I mean, yeah. kind of draw Can you say something about your, your family history? I think it was your, what, your grandfather who. Uh, we have a family Haggadah that was, my father is from an ultra-Orthodox background from Hungary, and he's a descendant of someone named the Chasim Sofer, who was a very important oh, wow. Hungarian rabbi. And his son, the Chasim Sofer's son, the Ksav Sofer, uh, made a Haggadah. And so that was one of the family Haggadahs we had. And I had always thought about translating that version, and uh, it's not every day that somebody asks you to work on Haggadah. I don't know how you guys felt, but, <laughs> but there was, at a certain point, you think like, you know, this is, this is an incredible opportunity, you know, especially, especially because it ha- is this thing that has been done for generations, four, five, 7,000 times. I mean, mm. it's, it's really, there's a weight there that really, uh, that, that I felt uh, personally. Um, now, Daniel, your, the Haggadah is a very, not only was the process serious, but the outcome, I think, is very serious. Your commentary is, how, how do you see it? Do you see it as, is there a serious side? Is it a funny, what, how would you, and, and maybe after you answer that, you, if you could read, I know you actually well, don't have a Haggadah. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, what was it, were you trying to find a certain voice? Was it a challenge? Did you have a... Well, I think the, um, the voice of Lemony Snicket is things are so terrible that eventually they kind of become hilarious and vice versa. Um, and that I always thought was kind of Judaism in a nutshell. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I mean, um, uh, Jonathan and I had never met face to face until this sounds now really like a talk show. We were just in the green room. And, and um, we'd never met face to face. And the conversation that we had 
before we came out here was kind of this combination of uh, highfalutin, what are we gonna talk about, and here's the Haggadah project, and, and here's what's going on, and like filthy, filthy jokes from this man's mouth. <laughs> Disgusting jokes. And, and that felt, uh, I felt right at home. I felt exact, certainly exactly every Passover table I was ever at as a child was this combination of be quiet because we need to talk very seriously about something that happened thousands of years ago and gossip, cheap gossip. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, f I have a Thaler, too, who should be in the audience, because then right. I could talk about my Thaler. Anyway, <laughs> Mike Thaler, he's not here, I don't think. It would be weird if he were, but he isn't. Um, you are? <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, well, that's what I mean. Then you know what I'm talking about. So you don't have to have someone to explain it to you. I can't believe he's here. It's so hilarious. Mike Thaler, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I we're, will read... We're gonna, we're gonna fight our Thalers so, after. Yeah, oh yeah, let's, no. <laughs> yes. I, I actually, the woman who drove me to school when I was a kid, her name was Thaler as well. <laughs> but that was in Where is she? There's Come no on, chance. she's gotta be here. No. <laughs> actually, she passed away. Yeah, oh. <laughs> you see? It was hilarious until it got sad. No. <laughs> um, but I mean, there, yeah, it's... I mean, th that is exactly the tone. If you talk about any aspect of the story of Pesach, it is hilarious and sad. It's heartbreaking and horrifying, and, that it, and then you begin to get the giggles. And that, you know, you can't use the phrase wandered for years in the desert without immediately getting giggly, because it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. My sister and I used to joke, like, who wouldn't give up after nine plagues? <laughs> you know? Wouldn't you? You know, what, you would be like, uh, from what my understanding of the Hebrew God, he's only got nine, so we just gotta get through this. And like, no, you, no, so. Um, but this is um, commentary on the four types of sons. Um, some scholars believe there are four kinds of parents as well. <laughs> the wise parent is an utter bore. Listen closely, because you are younger than I am, says the wise parent, and I will go on and on about Jewish history based on some foggy memories of my own religious upbringing, as well as an article in a Jewish journal I have recently skimmed. The wise parent must be faced with a small smile of dim interest. <laughs> the wicked parent tries to cram the story of our liberation into a set of narrow opinions about the world. The Lord led us out of Egypt, the wicked parent says, which is why I support a bloodthirsty foreign policy and I'm tired of certain types of people causing problems. <laughs> LAUGHTER Which I actually remember was a line that you questioned because you said, um, do we want to be so specific about the, about the people we're scorning? <laughs> and, I, and I love that. Certain types of people causing problems that we were both equally sure about who we were scorning, but of course. <laughs> um, the wicked parent should be told in a firm voice, with a strong hand, God rescued the Jews from bondage, but it was my own clumsy hand that spilled hot soup in your lap. The simple parent does not grasp the concept of freedom. There will be no macaroons until you eat all of your brisket, <laughs> says the simple parent at a dinner honoring the liberation of oppressed peoples. <laughs> also, stop slouching at the table. In answer to such statements, the wise child will roll his eyes in the direction of the ceiling and declare, let my people go. <laughs> the parent who is unable to inquire has had too much wine and should be excused from the table. <laughs> um, thank you. And, I mean, not to then kill jokes by tying an anvil of serious meaning to them, but I, I do think, particularly when you're a child, the, the concept of 
freedom is difficult to grasp because you don't have any. <laughs> um, and every opportunity for freedom uh, that you have as a child is uh, forbidden and, and frowned upon. So the idea of a dinner where you could do anything you want sounds very glorious, but that isn't at all what a Passover Seder is. In fact, you have to behave much, much better than you do at practically any other meal because Mike Thaler's there and you got camp, um, <laughs> for instance. Um, and so, so I, I, I became very interested in that idea. And, um, and the, the categories of son always seemed depressive to me because I always thought, well, clearly I'm supposed to want to be the wise son, but he is such a kiss ass. And, <laughs> but I'm not so wicked as to not find any meaning in the holiday. Um, mm. and, that, and to think about different categories of parents that are all categories, and so because they're categories and because they're narrowly thought of, they're kind of the opposite of, of free circumstances. They're the opposite of who we all are, which is all types of people at all types of times. Um, and, but saying that, what I just said out loud, isn't that appealing, I think, particularly for an eight-year-old. But to tell a story of different kinds of parents that, that lead you to a place where you don't want to be, and then you think, what is the, what is the opposite of that? What is, what is the freedom that we're celebrating? That was interesting to me. It is interesting to me. Another way that the Haggadah engages people um, and engages people's senses, certainly, is through the, through the images and through the graphics. And I want to cue some images here. Maybe go through. So I think this is the Manishtana. Um, and move through some of these. Now, how, Jonathan, how did you... You say that you started out with Kate and then there were there were, there were quite so were a there, few were there um, visual memories? artists that I approached, but you know the real challenge is how to have, to my knowledge, I could be wrong about this, mm -hmm. but it's the only visually embellished um, Haggadah I've ever seen that it, it, that um, is text based, that isn't mm. that isn't figurative art. Um, I was very wary of figurative art for more reasons than we have time for, but one of them was not wanting um, too, too present in uh, artist sensibility. Um, you know, one of the, the truly great um, Haggadahs ever made was the Ben Shan Haggadah. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it is really a beautiful document, but it is the Ben Shan Haggadah. That's how it's known, that's what it is. It is not a Haggadah that Ben Shan worked on, it is the Ben Shan Haggadah. And to me, there's something it um, detracts from the spirit of the book, which is um, like creating space for the user. And so I thought, what kind of, you know, how to strike the balance of making something that is beautiful, that you could be proud to own, that um, is visually engaging and has a kind of rhythm throughout the book that gives reasons for people to turn pages. And, reasons to linger, um, that creates a sense of expectation or even drama, you know, visually, without over-prescribing meaning or having a heavy hand, like a heavy, the artist's heavy hand. So I became aware of this typographer, Oded Ezer. He's um, Israeli, but um, his work has been in MoMA. I mean, he's quite celebrated internationally. And um, I thought, you know, maybe there's an answer in there somewhere an answer in making art, the visual art out of the, the language rather than applying visual art to the language. And he had this idea which was really um, a breakthrough and I think a real stroke of genius. So there is um, a timeline that runs graphically across the tops of the pages. Yeah, I think um, you can see it there, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's basically the story of the story, how the, how the um, exodus, the story of the exodus, how how the how satyrs have um, just appeared throughout Jewish history and um, in different places across time and, and in world history, how different social justice movements have borrowed this, this story. It just kind of gives a, it contextualizes the book. And Oded said, what if I were to research what Hebrew lettering looked like, you know, handwriting or type later at those periods? You know, so 
I look at, I don't know, 600 BCE. Um, wh whatever the timeline happened to be on that page, mm -hmm. um, research what Hebrew looked like and use that as the basis for my design. So the book would become a kind of living record of mm. Hebrew lettering. Um, and what's really fascinating is how much it's changed. I mean, there are some pages where it's, it's almost unrecognizable. Um, so I thought that, it, 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 I mean, if, without knowing that, and I imagine most readers will never know that, it's only mentioned in his little note at the very end. Um, without knowing it, it's just a beautiful book. But knowing it, it, it becomes, um, something I think really quite, quite deep. Mm. I, also, I also want to ask you about the, the title. In, in an interview, um, I think you were asked about it and you said that, you de-emphasized the idea that there was anything new or anything particularly American about it and rather it was because of a tradition of naming Haggadahs after the places where <coughs> they were published or where they made their way like the Sarajevo Haggadah. Um, but I want to push you a little bit on that and I want to, I want to do that beginning with a quote from Julia Neuberger in the Financial Times. She wrote, this Haggadah marketed in the US as the new American Haggadah is consciously American in its preoccupations. Do you have an idea what she's referring to? Can you guess? Um, do you, you should do, read do more of what she said. It was such a nice review. It's a it, was, it was a great We're only great. making a point when, <laughs> we, when we could be. I think she praise. referred to it as a magnificent <laughs> Haggadah. That's true. Yeah. But what, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but in what way is it, in what, do you agree that it's American it in its pre preoccupations, or do you? I think it is, although it's not overlaying any particular agenda. I don't think it's exclusive to, the meaning is exclusive to Americans. I mean, it so happens that all of the contributors are American, and so their perspectives are, to some extent, necessarily American, and um, Jeffrey Goldberg in particular, who is writing from the, the um, the, what we call the, the nation perspective. You yeah. know, how did the, what are the questions raised here that, that should be, that the Jews as a people might ask? Um, it, it is not, um, again, exclusive to American Jews because it, he dwells quite a bit on what it means to be in the diaspora, what, it, what is the difference between being an Israeli Jew and American Jew, but he does make plenty of references to American politics. So, um, you know, here's the thing. The book had to have a name. You know, it just simply had to have a name. And did, did it have other names? I mean, did you give it other names and then toss those out? Or N No, actually this was, I, I don't remember. Do you remember any other names? We're both pic picturing like 20 names. Just for <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um, the, the, the challenge, the same challenge with the, with the visual art. Like, yeah. how do you create some kind of meaning, some kind of identity without, without, um, like constraining the meaning. How do you how do you how do you title it in such a way that makes it open rather than closed? You know, so it's a tough exercise. You know, I wonder what you would have. Well, let me let it. me let me give come at it from a historical perspective. If we were to look in the 1950s and 60s, let's say the 60s, would Philip Roth, Saul Bellow, Maurice Sendak, to include a you know children's author, would they have put together? A, can you imagine a Haggadah where you had that team? The Philip Roth Haggadah. Uh, you know, I mean, does that, in other words, is one of the ways in which this is new because it's a, d a new moment in American Jewish literature where you have people like the people that you assembled, including yourself, who were willing to put other things down and take it as seriously as, uh, as, uh, as, as everyone did. And I'll add something else, which was Saul Bellow did do a translation, right? right? He, he was pivotal and he translated Gimbal the Fool. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very different kind of work, obviously, right? It's Isaac Bishop at Singer's story. But it's decidedly not a traditional religious text. So is, is that way, is, is this one way at least that it, it reflects a new moment in not only American Jewish literature, but American Jewish society, we could say? I, I would hope. And this is for all, everyone, I mean, not just for you, Jonathan. I mean, I would really hope not about the literary thing, that it's done with great humility, like that, yeah, it's, it's definitely not about claiming some new... No, but I, new I, I, but I, what's I, happened, to, I mean, they would, I don't think they would do that. They, I, they I didn't do it, it anyway. Observance so, is... <laughs> what, what, I'm asking this about, you, you know, is there something different now that you could get some very prominent American Jewish writers who would 
participate in this project. And I don't think that would have happened, you know, decades ago. I think observance is, is cyclical, seasonal, at least, that, you know, they were living in response to things that we are not living in response to, um, to being a first generation American, to um, the Holocaust, you know, to um, like the challenges of assimilation. And, you know, my generation, um, which I will include Nathan in, um, we have, we, we, <laughs> We have a joke. We, we tease because we love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, my generation does, isn't, yeah. isn't responding to that. It's responding to the response to that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's responding to, like, the, the pushing away from Jewish identity. It's responding to the, um, like, gravitation toward an assimilated American identity. And maybe is more interested in reclaiming certain things. I don't think that I identify any more as a Jew than the writers that you mentioned. They're just different ways of identifying. And I think that we probably, you know, luxuriate in a kind of freedom to do this that a previous generation didn't. Mm -hmm. Because there were, there were, there were um, you know, being a Jew in the 50s which was a much more fraught thing in America than it is now. That's the, I mean, that's the whole point. I just, I mean, yeah, if you're the literary front, I could do that. Now I need to turn this into a whiteboard. I have my own slides. But you do the literary <laughs> thing. But that's the whole point is they were, you know, that was the American dream was to become American. That a Jew wrote the natural is like a crazy thing to me. You know, they were writing about, you know, and, and Portnoy chasing after monkey, like getting the blonde girl. You know, there was the idea of them fighting to become American. In fact, they worked so hard to become American that, like, that my parents could have the strength to then make a shtetl on Long Island. And I feel like that's, mm -hmm. but I feel like that's the point. Like America, it was all about the melting pot and becoming American. And now it's about the special interest group, except now it's about some sort of strange theocratic well, thing. And Give me Philip your Roth was right coming now. to prominence, it seems like he, to a large portion of the American public, he already kind of had a Haggadah around his neck already. So maybe <laughs> yeah. he didn't want to do one. That's what I would guess. But I, but I also love about the name of Jonathan saying city names like, you know, like the Sarajevo Haggadah or the birds had a Haggadah when Jews didn't do figurative stuff. I love this idea. I like the new on New American because it reminds me of like the Alt Nushul and pro like the mm. old new, like <clears throat> I love that this is the new American Haggadah because it's right now, but soon it'll be the old new. You know, I love that idea of placing it in time. Like we are always at the furthest, you know, we're at the newest moment right now. I'll say one thing I liked about it was when I learned the name that um, I was moving all of my files from it into a folder on my computer and then it ended up being called Nah. <laughs> the new American Haggadah. And that felt very Jewish. You know. <laughs> so, uh, another, another way in which, in which like, it's new you is know, that... Do you want to live in Egypt anymore? Yeah. Nah. <laughs> another way is in which Is the pharaoh going to let us go? <laughs> nah. <laughs> Another way in which it's new <laughs> is that it is, as far as I know, the first Sagata that made its way um, onto the, the Colbert Report. Uh, number, number seven on Amazon, uh, a after the New York Times uh, article interview with, uh, with Nathan and Jonathan came out, I, I checked on Amazon, and it was, it was number seven, um, and I did actually write down what it was in between. It was interesting to see what was six and eight, but fortunately it doesn't appear on my, my page here. Um, <laughs> it, it was Hunger Games and Hunger Games. Yes, I, I think it was that. Um, so I think that's the first time that that's happened. Um, on the other hand, the Maxwell House Sagata apparently has 50 million copies in print. No, even Amazon can't beat free. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. would be ten, 10 copies for every Jew in the United States. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're in people's drawers and things like that. But the, the question I want to ask is, um, do you think that uh, non-Jews are also buying it? And was that an audience that you thought of when you were putting it together? And what, what do you think that they might be getting out of it? Why, why would they get it? Why would they buy it? The what? truth is I have absolutely no idea. I, yeah. I, I really have no idea. They, they don't, in Amazon, they don't break it down into Jew and non-Jew? <laughs> I, I am quite sure they do, but they don't oh, share okay, the yeah, information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you can just, you can figure out who asked for free shipping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> is that a hiss, really? Did someone? No, that was a laugh. Yeah. 
Was that Mike Thaler? His name on it? Exactly. I don't know. I really don't know. I can tell you that I never, and I don't think we ever had an audience in mind at all, um, except for at one point, which was when we were going over the um, translation. We had it proofed by an Orthodox um, rabbi just to make sure that it was usable, you know, for anybody who wanted to use it. That we weren't, that we were being as careful as we possibly could. That that big, uh, you know, it was very far into this translation. I thought I'm working on it. I was like, oh, conservative Jews can use this reformed Jews. And I thought, it, back to living in a place, I can't stand tolerance. I like respect. I don't want to be tolerated. I hope you don't want to be tolerated by me. I like to be respected. But, you know, I lived in Jerusalem for a long time, and I know the difference between tolerance and respect. But in mm -hmm. America, where we try and function together, you know, but that idea that I thought, you know, that my sister or my family, that's so deeply, that, that there I was years into a Haggadah that would only be able to be used by a portion of the public was, you know, the Jewish public was, I really thought that it should be Haggadah. For, you can not want to use it because you don't like the art or the translation or mm -hmm. have trouble with the commentaries or any, there's a million reasons to say this is not for you personally, but it was, got really important that it be for everyone. And yeah, so we made a real effort that it should be, you know, just a liturgy that works across the board. So I want to ask you uh, uh, another couple of questions about the translation. Um, one of them, which has come up when I've talked about the Haggadah, or people have seen the Haggadah, um, has to do with gender. And I want, to, I want to read a couple of quotes. One is from the review in the Financial Times. Uh, Newberger says, I might have wished for it to be more egalitarian with children instead of sons, for the story of the four sons, perhaps. She goes on to say, but, the, but these are just quibbles. But there's another, another uh, quote that was posted, I think it was today, on the Forward website, and this one sees it as more than a quibble. Quote, I loved it at first touch. That's the Haggadah. Okay. Then I read the first <laughs> line. You are blessed, Lord God of us, King of the cosmos, who has set us apart with his mitzvot and instituted us to eliminate all chametz. Lord, King, his, oh no. Women and girls are totally absent from the greatest story ever told in the new American Haggadah. I consider taking the books back to the bookstore. So that's pretty harsh. Um, what? What do you? What do you? you how do you what? respond I, to that? If you want to ask it, I would never respond. I have this as a fiction writer who's yeah. been out there a long time. Like, you know, the t title story of my collection is set in South Florida. If someone wants to come up to me to reading, be like, I love. That's my favorite story in the book. You know, I, I've been to Alaska. Anchorage is my favorite. You know, I always feel like I have. I, I think I said South Florida nine times. I guess I needed to say it ten, but I would never correct someone. My point is. Keep, take back the books, keep the books, don't, you know, like that person, every reader is always right. You must, humility, you're putting something out in the world that is not mine. If you want to discuss that, you know, uh, simply, I, the dedication, the obligation is to text. You know what I'm saying? This is not the, na back to that about, fo it's the same when I write fiction. When you write, the only time work is getting done, I, I you know, disagree, I'm sure it's the same for everyone, is when you actually fall away, when you disappear and think of your obligation to the story at hand. Like this is such a beautiful text. I, when I say like, uh, you know, I have an uh, Argentina novel, I say like that novel has all kinds of stuff hidden for people who know Buenos Aires in 76, like woven in there deep, that only they say, how could you, that's mm. my favorite compliment, how do you know? And then there's stuff woven in there for, you know, Jewish stuff will be like, oh wow, I saw that reference, and if you read Yehoshua backwards, like the White Album, you'll find this, you know, hidden in there. My point is I also always work for the close, careful reader. They're out, they're so good, this is a respectful, you know, this is not, it doesn't have to be, for, but like, it's, you know, it's a love of text. My obligate, Nathan, like if I, my translate, if I was making it mine and the things that are important to me, I would not kill firstborn children no matter what they did. <laughs> Honestly, I would take that out. It is a deeply mm -hmm. cruel, it is a merciless God that would kill, not all these people I'm sure tortured. I'm sure someone was nice to the Jews or didn't have a big job or was one step up from a slave and they took, God took that family's firstborn. You know, that is, that is biblical punishment. But it's not for me to say, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. I am, you know, my lefty credentials are radical. You know, I have a new thing lately. I really feel like all the states that don't recognize a gay marriage from New York, they are legal in New York. I want us to have reciprocal. I don't want you to be able to write down. I don't think we should accept marriages in New York from any state that doesn't accept ours. Like if you come Mr. and Mrs., you know, like, honestly, I want to start that thing. Like you should have to write down something else in the hotel book, but you are not welcome. <laughs> Seriously, but like, you know, it's a, it's a legal thing. There is thing. no worse punishment than, than having that, you read something exactly, else in the hotel, hotel book. book. But my point is, you know what I'm not saying? Not that there are hotel like, books it's anymore, not about but if there were. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, I, I live in the 1950s. My point is, like, you know, I don't even want to get into an argument about that. Like, 
the text, it would be really strange for me to completely alter this text. Like, you know, and I would get into that for an hour. Like the word, you know, masculine, blue is kachol, kola. Like I even think when it says, you know, when he took, you know, like man and woman, it's actually human and human to me. I could go on for like nine hours. Mm-hmm. Why it's actually not even, when they say it's marriage between a man and a woman, it's actually marriage between a human and a vagina human. You know, like <laughs> it, it actually doesn't even have to be a proof of, ma- you know, there were only two of them. Who else? It's just the feminine. For- My point is... I, I, I honestly, I can't be any more, le- like, it's not about that. My point yeah. is, this is what the text is. It says God, it says he, and whenever possible, I don't know how well this woman study it, like, after like, and they live there. It's so clearly a few men, which is an awesome end to a sentence. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, settle there with a few men. It's even, it's clean, it's crystal clear. I struggle till the end and I put in a small group because it was important to me that there be mm-hmm. that signal to people that that's important to. And sometimes it says children of Israel, even though it says very clearly sons of Israel. But I thought, you know what I'm saying? Everything took millions of hours. And I thought, a few men, a few men, a few men, this settlement. I was like, no, these are the first Jews. This has to be inclusive. There weren't just men there. There were women there. So this because is, it's not a, li- I mean, I, somebody else wrote, uh, it, it, this it, is, a, is a hyper, a hyper, a literal translation, which I don't think it is. Yeah. I mean, there are places where you, where you and, and actually, if you, if you wouldn't mind reading I think it's on page 96, the Echad Mi Odea, right? Oh, you have oh yeah, a, that's the least literal. Are we, so that's I, the least, I mean, that's, yeah. so, so how is it, what, what, no, what the, it's, it? it's, it's every, everything is a decision. That's why I feel yeah. like this helped, you know, fiction so much for me, because it's, you just have to make a decision. Is it rhythm? Is it meaning? Is it what it's translating? Is it who's reading? And Matei Ma'ad, I said, I'm going, even though few men is rhythmically better and clearer and smart, all this stuff, it needs to be a small group because this is inclusive of all the Israelites. But that, that's my point is this is what the text is. And that idea of, you know, there are feminist Haggadah, like there's God-free Haggadah. If I, you know what I'm saying? I said, I'm trying to be an atheist. If I removed God from this Haggadah, that's, I, my obligation is to text. Mm-hmm. And in every choice, it was, what does the text say? And I really expect when it says B'nai Israel, sons of Israel, that we understand it's an ancient text like if you're really you have to understand that that's inclusive of everyone this is the language of the time you know it'd be like me rewriting Merchant of Venice and be like let's do it but does he have to be a Jew it makes him seem so cheap you know <laughs> like you know and I, so anyway I really stand by you know but my point is those tiny things are all in there for the close reader but I can't speak to anyone who you know you want to find those things you will find them but yeah this is actually the most and this is the point this is the one furthest furthest from the Hebrew though it's still all in there but this is a song of rhythm and I felt like the rhythm that was so close to my heart in Hebrew was just not there in the English translation of it and so I riffed a little but I'll just you wanted me to read 12 I guess yeah please 12, 12, who knows? With, I am not a singer. I'll just read it that way. 12, 12, who knows? 12, 12, 12, I know 12. 12 are the tribes, one each for Jacob's sons. And 11 are the stars minus Joseph's one. And 10 are the commandments, God's will be done. And mine, nine moon cycles before the baby comes. And eight is the day on which the Brit is done. And seven days pass with the setting of the Sabbath sun. And six are the parts of the Mishnah. And five are the books of the Torah. And four are the mothers whence we come. And three are the fathers, Abraham first among. And two are the tablets of our bond, and one is Hashem in the heavens and the earth. Ooh, ah. Ooh, ooh, ah. <laughs> All right. Well, we have, we have reached the end of our time uh, for at least this part of our conversation, and then uh, we're going to be taking questions. Um, so, we have. <clears throat> she was definitely first. Hi, my name's Elizabeth, and um, I had a similar reaction to what you were reading when I, uh, we got tickets right away, and I was really excited, and we have a whole collection of all different kinds of Haggadahs from um, my grandparents, you know, all, all through the generations. But I was disappointed when the first passage I read was, you know, king of the universe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it seems like, to me anyway, I understand what you're saying about translation, but it seems to me that um, at least when you look at uh, reform uh, prayer books, you don't just have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob anymore. You have Abraham and Sarah, I, I Isaac tell- and Rebecca. Uh, yeah. And so it, it seems to me um, as, as the parent of, uh, of two daughters that I don't know. We just get tired of seeing 
he this and king that. Mm -hmm. And how about using um, Adonai, Creator, Hashem, ones that are not so... Um, the, 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 you're addressing a move. This is a perfect... My point is there's no answer to this question except you're talking about the reform, you're talking about a movement with a belief system. Conserve is a movement with a belief system. Reconstruction is a movement of the belief. The Baha'i or the Baha'i, like this is a translation of, I, I'm not affiliated with anything. This was a book by people obsessed with text and I am, Jonathan asked me, this is, this is what the text is. I get you, I, my, my point is, I personally am inclusive. I'm happy to list every name you want, but that is not this. Te the reform movement, ha my point is, you found a Haggadah that works for you because it adds all these names that are not in the text to make it inclusive. That's beautiful. But I, you know what I'm saying? Uh, my whole goal was to translate this text as it is in Hebrew. I, I, I don't know what to do. I would, I would that. hope that people who would read the book would, it, that it would be very clear pretty quickly that it's not a misogynistic book, that it's not a misogynistic edition, that it's a very sensitive edition and it is sensitive to the, in large part, to the problems, to the fraught moments in the Haggadah itself, and that this is something that is clearly worth discussing. But I think we almost took for granted that it would be discussed, that when you get to the yeah, four sons. Yeah, this is super, super, this is honestly so wildly surprising to me. Like, on, it's the first day I'm hearing it, and it's like, it's a big shot. You know, I promise you tomorrow I'll be like extra polished, and it'll be smoother and seem less like <laughs> headlights, but it feels headlights. Like I spent years, you know what I'm saying? Personally, it would be shocking to me that I would do something that would, you know, you know be a part of something that was, but, but it's, it's that idea, it really, yeah, I'm I, literally surprised. I that as a But that, that would That's also inevitable. be... That's inevitable. Yeah. You know so the old saying, nothing is good for the Jews? Like, <laughs> there, there are just too many different kinds. And, the, and the, the notion of appealing to everybody is, is not Jewish. And, you know, so... <laughs> yes. We, we made an awful lot of choices. It's, it's Lutheran. And, and you pay a price. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, as a rabbi who screamed at me, I am clearly not religious today because of this man, but what's really helped me understand this thing, he used to scream at us, anyone more religious than me is a fanatic. And that really, <laughs> that's the line. It, one way or the other, there's always, it's my way, you know, and... <laughs> the next question is going to be from over here. Hi, thank you. Uh, it's... Uh, mostly a question for Nathan, but maybe you can all speak to it. Is how did the experience of working on this book and this translation change your relationship to uh, to spirituality and specifically you to being an atheist? And do uh, you feel like you have some newfound love for God, or uh, does no, it, it, and, and is it going to change the way that you celebrate the the holiday? This confirmed. You know what? It's nice. People only. When people aren't religious, people always ask this question about faith. When people have been religious and go the other way, I don't go up to my religious friends and say, are you done yet? Like, have you, <laughs> like, honestly, have you, ha have you had enough? You know, like, but my point is, you know what this did? This, this, but with deep seriousness, this confirmed my spiritual journey of spiritualistness. You know, like, I can't even tell you what it reminded me. I've dedicated my life to books. I've dedicated my life, you know what I'm saying? The Jews come into my, I try to keep my head Judenrein, the Jews come in all the time, they go into my stories. But this, you know what this made me see? I love text so much, I can't even tell you, I don't think Jonathan will mind, but his wife, who is also her own person, but the author, Nicole Krauss, but she had said to me, just when we saw each other recently, like, maybe we should do like a text study, like what if we, you know, like my point is, I, I have a set of tools, it'd be like I was a pole vaulter and I haven't picked up my vault or pole, you know, <laughs> you know, in a hundred years. Like my point is, I, my parents, my parents spent a literal fortune that they did not have so I could reject this education. <laughs> but, you know, I have these tools and it was really lovely, you know, I see, Bar it was so fun, I, like, you know what I'm saying, like, to learn with Bark, to learn with Jonathan, like, we had such a good time. My point is, I see, God, I really love text and have trouble with organized religion. So, in, in fact, it made, yes, it made me so much more spiritual about my dedication to words and books. Lo logos, it's sort of the universal religion of the word. It's just a, some of the, the writing is so beautiful and the words that you chose and the way that you put it into English. It's just, it's very touching and, and lovely. That means a lot to me. Thank you for sharing. Question over here. Hi. Um, 
I, I managed to look at the book a little bit. It's really beautiful. Um, Jonathan, when you were talking about going into London and they asked you questions and they asked you, well, is it fiction? And you sort of didn't answer the question. And I'm also noticing there's the timeline in the book, but it's not, it's a, it's a modern timeline, right? It's, 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 you know, AD, it's all AD. No, it's not. Okay, well, but my question is like, in, but if it like were. how, well, I, I mean, the book's just out. I haven't seen the whole thing yet. Uh, like, did the question of the historicity of the central story become something that you grappled with at all? No, I don't actually think it's very important. Um, I mean, what is true is that the story has been told for by more than a hundred generations of Jews. Um, what is true is that it's you know, whatever happened in Egypt w has had less impact on the world than the particular way that the story has resonated and been retold and been borrowed. So. Um, you know, this is always true that historical events are less important than the stories that are told about them. Um, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein writes really beautifully in this Haggadah about how the Seder is a kind of sanctification of storytelling. Um, you know, and, 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 and that is what families are gathering to do. Why? Not just because they're entertaining, but because everything that's good and important in life is embedded in a story. You know, why? Why is the Torah a story? Why is, it, why is there Adam? Why is there Eve? Why is there Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You know, if, if, if what we were having is the, the transmission of laws from God to um, his or her people, uh, you know, why wouldn't it simply be a listing of the laws? Because, because that, it, it's very hard for the, to, to um, evoke the necessary empathy that way, it, to, to get people to feel not that they are the recipients of something, but complicit in something, you know, involved in something, co-creators, um, it really has to be embedded in a story. And to me, the truth of this event is, is the story that's been told about it. We're here. Hi. At the beginning, you made some very nice comments, they're very eloquent comments about the Haggadah and the different uses of it. It's also a manual, and I'm just curious whether you've done a test drive uh, at a mock Seder to see how the Haggadah works? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, just, I was going to say, for as uh, it's like leaking the script or something, but over the years it's been taking us so long. That's, everyone's like, for, I can't tell you how many years, and for Jonathan, clearly more right, everybody involved, the people are like, is it going to be ready for this Pesach? Yeah. And my answer became, unless it comes out on Seder night, it will be before some Pesach, as the years went by. <laughs> it will eventually be before one. It's before this one. But uh, no, like last year, just uh, at a very not religious, but beautifully cooked Seder, you know, like the second night, but uh, at my cousin's, you know, they just said, oh, do you have some pages? Like, actually, Jonathan just sent me some PDFs, and, you know, we had the, some commentaries and some timeline, and we just pulled it up on a bunch of iPhones. It's an iPhone Seder. <laughs> but you know what? As our ancestors did. As our ancestors did, exactly. When it was, two, when it was 2G in the yeah. desert, yeah. But, um, <laughs> But, uh, but that was the idea, like, I, could, I was like, it's sort of like, she floats, like when you put a boat in the water, and I've never put a boat in the water. Anyway, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> When you vault your exactly, boat. Exactly, yeah. when I clear that bar, I just feel free. <laughs> but the point is, you know, like, there we are working, then someone's just, you know, turns their phone, so, and then the thing turns, but somebody, like, picks up on the timeline, or takes one, of the, like, it really fomented discussion, at, like, as planned. You know, one of the things I'm actually most proud of, which nobody will ever comment on, are the instructions. The, they're in the left margin, you know, dividing different activities. This is when you do this, this is when you do that. I think we gave as much thought to that as we did the translation of the liturgy. Yes. And, you know, we gave a lot of thought to how, what, what customs should be included and what shouldn't. Like, when the afikoman, I think, is, is hidden, we might have a bit about, I don't even remember exactly what we included and didn't, but right. about putting it on one's back and, yeah, yeah. and, and the Sephardic, yeah, that lovely. A, 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 a Sephardic tradition of putting the, the matzah on the back and just gesturing for a moment, um, burden. And, you know, we could have included thousands of those, but yeah. um, it, was, it was a lot of fun to think about the book as a practical book, the book as something that is, that is used. I think that, the, uh, and I don't know if this was your experience, but I 
I had my own commentaries, and then as we got closer to it, I had kind of drafts or closer things, right. a little other fragments of it that I tested at my own seders, and then um, and then you realize while while you're testing them that it, that being as the goal argument is inevitable, so then how do you know if it's working? <laughs> <laughs> so that you know, and that and that became its own lesson right. because um, like marriage it, it, you know they were <laughs> they were bad for the Jews they're all you know some people liked them and some people didn't and then I thought what what, what would that look like if it were different well different people would like them and different people wouldn't mm -hmm. and then I um, you know b became paralyzed and enlightened <laughs> <laughs> question over here hi my name is Madison my question is for Mr. Handler mm -hmm. um, you talked about that you feel like a uh, sense of humor lends itself to tragedy and then vice versa. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, what shaped your sense of humor and your sense of tragedy and then how you translate that to your stories. I guess because you're just so incredibly funny and so how does that all that funniness that bounces around in your head, how does it get spit back onto a page? <laughs> the spitting is A lot of spitting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, in terms of where the sensibility came from, I think it came from uh, my Jewish upbringing and that the, um, my father got out of Germany in 38 and some people didn't. Uh, and that the stories around the family table were um, certainly full of nervousness and hilarity. And, um, and I think that's, that's where it came from. And then... Um, I think that when you are going to be a writer, it, it may take you a while, but eventually who you are is what is projected in some way onto the page. And so um, my, earl my early work, my juvenilia, um, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote very serious books because it was a literary project for me. I thought it was very important that they would be serious. So I would work all day on them, and then at night I would make fun of them in my head. Um, and I began to think, maybe you should make something that you don't find inherently ridiculous, <laughs> which I haven't been able to do yet. But, <laughs> but gradually, I, I, I began to see that I should let what I, how I looked at the world into what I was doing, and that's how it came out as a story. Couple more questions. Hi. Um, I don't come from a Jewish family, but last year for the first time I got to experience a Passover Seder dinner, and I have to admit I was a little bit confused trying to follow along some native Hebrew speakers, some non, you know, using a child's edition, feeling very much like the child at this particular gathering, and I was wondering, I haven't had a chance to um, read the New American Haggadah yet, but I was wondering to what degree is this accessible and educational for people who are both non-Jewish and or don't have a firm grasp of Hebrew and, you know, uh, what can, can we expect to gain from this text? Where is the person who asked the question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> she, they made her sit in the back. Uh, <laughs> the, the, that's our policy, sorry. <laughs> I think a lot of the, the burden is actually on the, um, the leader of the Seder. I mean, it's just always going to be the case. And, you know, if the, the success of a Seder is constrained by the Haggadah, it's, it's at least as much constrained by, you know, the energy that the Seder leader brings to it. You know, there is a way of using this book that is really dull. And there's a way of using it, I think, that's incredibly exciting and provocative. So, um, you know, we did our best to just put materials there that, that could be springboards for conversations, but th it still needs to, somebody, you know, the fact is very few people I imagine are going to move from the first word to the last word of this. Um, so probably what will happen is a Seder leader will read in advance, maybe as my father did um, for our Seders, like assign bits as homework in advance or, he would you know, send us essays that had been written recently or just say, I'd like you to think about what's going on in this place in the world right now and we'll talk about it in the context of these themes so that you arrive at the Seder with some 
not only an expectation, but some preparedness. You know, so it can be a serious experience. I mean, that, that ultimately is the choice that one has to make. Is it going to be a serious experience or not? And I think it's a story of mystery, and so it's ac I think it's appropriate to be mystified in a way. I mean, I think that um, when you go to, it, it, even if you have a Seder every year or two, and you um, go to someone else's Seder, it becomes mystifying. You yes. know, and that, that, um, that trying to give someone a Jewish education ends up being an education about you as a Jew. You know, so it's kind of exactly the amount of money yeah. that you spend so you can reject the traditions. Yes. That you end up saying, this is a very revered tradition and we do it exactly this way. And then you turn the page and you say, oh, this is another tradition, we've never right. done that one. And that, you know, and that... Um, I think I, if I had kids, I would want to raise them religious so they could leave. I would want them to have that well, same this is, I, I have a son and my wife and I, our joke always is, how do we raise our son to reject the same values we rejected? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Last question over here. Uh, Jonathan and Nathan, both of you have been very productive in your novels and short stories that have come out over the past several years. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier in four times as many books than the two of us together. <laughs> but I, I wondered know. whether... When I look. hit the 50 million copy mark. <laughs> but the question is whether this work in, uh, was incorporated into your productivity of any of the novels and short stories, whether they helped to set in motion uh, the stories that you've written most recently. Uh, I can, you know, I, I would, the last couple years I was working on this and also writing a play, working at two things by which I do not identify, and it totally, the, the things that, you know, especially sort of self-motivated, self-employed folk, like, the idea, what drives you to write fiction is because it's so important to you, but something that, that is that important to you can also be overwhelming. It's import, it's idea of dreaming of being a writer and then figuring out it's writing, the weight is so great, and this idea of finding myself so utterly consumed as a translator. I never wanted to be one, I don't identify one, or oh, so utterly consumed as a playwright. It reminded me of like core beliefs and identity and ownership of material and freed up my mind. Yes, the collection that I wrote this year would have taken me 20. It really, it's so, I see how much, or just working with other people, it's just so fed me, this, this conversation. If anyone has a project they want me to join in on, I'm happy to do it with them. <laughs> Seriously, like I say I, yes to every, like it was so great to do this together. I can't even tell you how it fed, fed, you know, fed into my other work. It changed me as a writer, or set me back to that original thing, what it is to be alone in a room and working, you know. Again, I have no reference points at all. It was working without reference points. It was utterly freeing. That's the whole idea of this book. I, I, I just got a real education in the process of putting it together. I, um, you know, I, I put it in terms of writing to, to authors and artists asking if they wanted to participate, but a lot of the emails I was writing then was to um, rabbis or to scholars asking for reading lists. Um, I just got a reading list from Nathaniel, not but a couple months ago. Um, and I, f I felt like I acquired a, a body of knowledge I just didn't have before. And um, and, and it was really thrilling. I mean, really, really thrilling. And, um, you know, writing comes from, from somewhere. It comes from your experiences, but it also comes from your, your knowledge base. So I, I, am, I, I am excited to, to, to see how these incredible books that I read and wouldn't have read otherwise will somehow, you know, come back out in other forms. Can, can I add something? Well, sorry, well, and I'll just say that um, I, there's a new Snicket series that starts this fall, and I started working on it when, uh, about the time when I, when the kind of Haggadah was reinvented and I was asked to come on and that the, um, I was having trouble with structural elements in it, and the series is called All the Wrong Questions. There's four of them. <laughs> 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 so it creeped in. Oh, and I just want to say, even we all work with language and working with words, but even just, I just wanted to, you know, give another shout out to Oded's magnificent 
design, but that idea, like, I know what process is. You know, people always say, like, you can't just write the final draft of something if it's part of a writing process, because a process has parts to it. That's why it's a process. But even seeing this form, you know, I know how, sort of, we, we all know when we're banging our head against the wall working on something, sort of, you know, oh, I'm going crazy now, I'm always going crazy at week nine. You, like, you sort of know how that process is going to unfold, but even to see a visual process unfold was also, I think, a real gift for me, because that earliest work, those cutout letters that he said, I mean, everything he sent was magnificent, but just not, re it was just wonderful also to watch the visual unfold. That was a whole education for me to see someone working with images that way and watch those develop in, this, in, in their own narrative form. You want to give an answer? No, I think I, I like your answers. <laughs> Happy to. He's like Nathan gave two. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much to our esteemed pan panel. Thank you to our audience. We'll have a book signing and a reception in the atrium. Thank you so much.